o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock Pacific. Um, Mark, uh, make sure you start the recording, please. Thank you. Um, and I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of Cooperative Development Services. This is the fifth in a series of six webinars, so we have one more one week from today, same time, uh, with Mel Braverman presenting on uh, feasibility analysis and business planning. If you haven't registered for that yet, we hope you will. Well, we're very glad that you've joined us. Uh, many of you have participated in our previous four seminars. And I've told you a little bit about CDS and the various waves of food co-op development uh, that have happened. Um, and you're aware that you're in the third wave um, that we're aware of and that CDS and has joined with the National Cooperative Bank, NCB, and the National Cooperative Grocers Association to form Food Co-op 500 uh, to be able to support you as, as much as we can uh, to help you learn from the lessons that, that we've learned from previous food co-op development efforts and to uh, support you in, in trying to serve your communities and to be successful over the long haul. Uh, I want to uh, move now to introduce Stuart Reed, who is uh, the food co-op development specialist with Food Co-op 500. I, I uh, work with this organization that is one of the co-sponsors, and our job is to try to provide the resources, tools, and support that all of you out there organizing new co-ops can use to get off the ground quicker, more effectively, and with a better chance of success. I'm hopeful that I've talked to all of you already, and if I haven't, by all means, get in touch, and, and we can explore the ways that we can be of help to you. Thanks to everybody for helping present these. And I'll turn it back over to Mark for some logistical information. Thanks, Stuart. <clears throat> we just have a couple of announcements. Um, uh, you, as attendees, uh, lack voice privileges, and yet we really do want to hear your questions. And the way to do that is in the Go to Webinar toolbar. If you look, there's a, a bar there called Question and Answer. It might be uh, collapsed. If it is, click the little pyramid to the left of the word Question. That'll expand it. And then underneath the line that says, enter a question for the staff, you can type a question and hit send. And that will be going to Stuart. And Stuart will be uh, organizing and creating the uh, question queue and pass those questions along to Pete uh, when it's time for question and answer. So we do encourage uh, you to use that feature. Uh, it's worked out quite well in the last few sessions. Um, and the other part of the... Um, uh, tech announcement is that at the end of the session, uh, after we end the webinar, uh, it takes about a minute, but then a feedback form comes on and onto your screen, and we very much uh, would appreciate uh, having your input for today's session. And um, you have to wait. You have to wait around. So if you could please, you know, um, uh, plan to have those extra few minutes in your day, we'd appreciate it. Marilyn. The um, materials for today's webinar are available for you to download. The website for that is uh, visible on your screen now. And within a few days after the session, there will also be a recording of this webinar available at that same website. So look for that if you're interested in, uh, in hearing it again or sharing it with others in your group. Uh, next, I would like to, to uh, introduce you to Pete Davis. Uh, Pete is a market analyst and location research consultant with Cooperative Development Services. Pete has been working with us for nine years, uh, specializing in, in doing analysis for natural food co-ops. Um, but that's the end of a very long career. Pete has been doing this work for about 40 years and has uh, over that time uh, developed quite a bit of, of expertise and experience. So we're very fortunate to have Pete working with us with CDS and uh, we're very grateful that he's been willing to share uh, some of his expertise with you all today. So Pete, take it away. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I am headquartered in Port Townsend, Washington, but right now I'm speaking to you from a hotel in Bath, Maine. Uh, but with, through the wonders of technology these days, uh, we can do this. It doesn't matter where I am, I can do it. 
Anyhow, uh, the title of my presentation today is Market Research and the basically the part of market research that has to do with finding the right site and then projecting sales potential. The finding the right site uh, is probably one of the most important things up front that can be done relative to helping to ensure a successful food co-op out of the ground. Once we've done that, then we also want to talk about projecting the sales potential for the site uh, because uh, it doesn't do any good to open a store if, in fact, the level of sales is not sufficient to produce a level of volume. So basically, those are the two primary topics I'm going to be discussing today. First is finding the right site, uh, and the second is... Uh, going to basically work on determining the sales potential. What I plan to do is I want to go over uh, the first part of the presentation. I want to go over finding the right site, what constitutes it, and I want to talk about three primary types of characteristics that are important when it comes to finding the right site. These types of characteristics have to do with the facility with the location, which is a marketing term as opposed to a real estate term, and then site characteristics, which have to do more with the physical characteristics of the site. At the end of each of these subheadings, uh, I'm going to uh, take a, a quick break for any questions that might have come up uh, regarding that. Uh, if there are none, then I just pick up and I keep going. Uh, and then when we're finished, talking about the right site, again, an opportunity for some questions that may have been a little bit latent or a little bit late in coming, uh, but we'll, we'll address those before we get into determining the sales potential. So what I'd like to start with is what constitutes the right site facility characteristics. The first facility characteristic is what is the right size, or what is the size of the facility being considered? In planning for a store, we typically think of a sales area or the retail area of a store as being somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of the total area. Now, that is the general rule of thumb. Having said that, if you're going to have a store with an abnormally large community room or a central commissary or something like that, then your sales area will probably be a lower percentage. But generally speaking, for planning purposes, you would think of a store size having about 60 to 70 percent of the total area as being sales area. This is an important consideration because sales per square foot come into play in terms of determining the profitability of a store. But there are several things that need to be answered with respect to the size of the facility. Will there be a community room? Will there be a central commissary kitchen? Will there be a need for extra storage? Uh, a number of buying clubs, for example, often align with a local co-op, and there may be a, a need for additional storage in the back room of the store where uh, orders for the buying club can be sequestered away and kept out of the main stock. We generally think of the minimum size for a food store today of being in the neighborhood of 4,500 to 5,000 square feet. This yields a sales area of around 3,000 to maybe 3,500 square feet. In my opinion, and this is opinion only, but I think it's shared by a number of people, in my opinion, it takes a store sales area size of close to 3,500 feet in order to produce what I consider to be the critical mass that forms the basis for a full food store. When you think of a food store, there are a number of uh, departments that generally exist, uh, the kinds of departments that are typically thought of when a person thinks of going to the store, the dry grocery section, uh, the general merchandise section, vitamin supplements, uh, produce, Frozen food, dairy, some type of a deli, whether it be service or self-service, um, and so on. 
if all of those elements are not present in a store, then you are opening the doors to a facility that is somewhat less than totally competitive to whoever the competition may be in your market. The other thing that we find is that the usual break-even level, and this is obviously dependent upon specific instances, but the usual break-even level is going to be somewhere around $400 a square foot of sales area. What that means is that the general sales area of 3,500 feet in order to have a profitable store, you would want to think in terms of having somewhere around $1.4 million or more in annual sales if you're going to have a profitable venture. All of these things need to be taken into account when you're considering the size of the facility. Uh, I've had several instances where uh, clients have engaged me to come in and do a study, and I get there and find out that they're looking at a 1,200 square foot store or something like that. And generally speaking, that really is not large enough to make any major impact in the community where the store is being planned. So to recap real quickly, sales area is 60 to 70 percent of the total area. Minimum size of the store, you should think of 4,500 to 5,000 square feet, which is going to give you somewhere around 3,500 square feet of sales area. And for planning purposes, you usually think in terms of a break-even level of at least $400 per square foot of sales area. We also want to talk, and when we're talking about the facility, what is the shape? These are other considerations. Is it square or rectangular? Uh, you don't want a store that is overly long and narrow or overly uh, wide and very shallow. Uh, such... Um, aberrations, if you will, can bring about significant problems in merchandising a store in terms of having gondolas that are either way too long or way too short. So uh, the shape of the facility, to the extent that it's square or rectangular but almost square, would be probably pretty close to the ideal shape. Another facility characteristic is where is the uh, front door? Uh, is it in the middle of the front? Uh, is it uh, toward one corner? Uh, depending upon where it's located, it has a lot to do with how the store is merchandised inside, and it has a lot to do with where the parking will be most advantageous. So other considerations. Does the facility face the front, the, the front street? Uh, in other words, uh, is the store facing to the front or is it facing sideways? Um, does the facility face the parking lot? Uh, one of the things that we'll talk about later when we get into site characteristics is people like to park in front of a store and within sight of the front door. They don't like to park around the corner. So it's important that the facility face its parking lot. Does the facility have a loading dock? What was the facility formerly used as? Was it formerly a food store? Was it formerly a retail store? Was it formerly offices? Was it formerly a warehouse? Uh, what have you. And then finally, is the facility usable, practically speaking, as a retail store? So those are some of the things that need to be taken into consider in consideration when you start talking about a facility. Uh, at this point, uh, Stuart, have there been any questions? Well, we don't have anything for you yet, so I think we can continue on. All right, that's fine. Then let's move into the next subheading, and that has to do with the location characteristics. I define the location in terms of its marketing sense rather than its physical sense. Location characteristics are vitally important to a uh, food store, uh, and here I talk about various aspects of marketing of that store. For example, what is a trade area population? When we, when we talk about trade area population, we typically talk about not so much the total population, but we talk about population minus group quarters. Now, for those of you who are not used to dealing with census data, group quarters represent that portion of the population 
that is housed in some type of an institution, a prison, a hospital, a nursing home, a military barracks, uh, college dormitories, college fraternity houses or sorority houses, anything where people live uh, in a, an institutional environment. The reason we pull those out is because those people tend to eat institutionally. In other words, they tend to eat in community dining halls. As a result, they typically are not in the market for purchasing food for consumption at home. Food is prepared for them. Um, with certain group quarters populations, it's very evident. For example, the prison population. Obviously, the prison population is not going to be shopping at your co-op. But the same is true with other types of group quarters uh, population. Now, granted, students who live in a college dormitory or in a fraternity house, yes, they have the opportunity and the ability to go out and go shopping. But as a practical matter, the majority of them eat institutionally, and therefore their expenditure potential, their spending habits are far less than they would be if those people were housed in private households. So when we talk about the trade area population, we're talking about not so much the total population, but rather the household-based population, which is total population minus the group quarters population. This information is available on the census at the census track level, and so it's data that I deal with all the time. The next aspect of location characteristics has to do with trade area demographics. What we have done over the years is we have done studies of hundreds of natural food stores and co-ops, especially food stores around the country in all types of locations and sites, all types of markets, all types of, of uh, uh, shopping centers, freestanding, uh, large shopping centers, strip shopping centers, neighborhood locations, highway locations, etc. We have taken all of these stores that we've, in, in which we've done studies, and we have taken their trade areas and their sales penetration within those trade areas, which is sales per capita at the census tract level, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And we have done some regression analysis and some correlation analysis where we have looked at what are the demographic characteristics of a trade area that tend to lead toward high levels of sales penetration versus low levels of sales penetration. In doing so, we control, what we do is uh, statistically we control for distance. Um, and so we're looking at basically what are the demographics that cause a store's sales penetration levels to be high versus those that tend to be low. And this is what we found. We have found, at least up to this point in time, uh, that the uh, co-ops traditionally have an ethnically white uh, uh, population from which they draw. We also have found that there's a positive tendency uh, sales penetration for those people aged 35 to 54. Younger people doesn't mean that they don't shop at a food co-op. What it does mean is that they typically uh, are in the family formative stages and probably are at an economic level in which they are not able to do all of their shopping at a food store or co-op. At the other extreme, age 55 and older, we find that those people typically um, once they start getting towards fixed income, uh, generally speaking, are not uh, looking at purchasing from a food co-op, but rather are looking more at purchasing, um, you know, less expensive uh, foods at more conventional stores. We find there's a very strong positive correlation between food co-op sales penetration levels and levels of college education. And this is certainly not a surprise. We find that where college education tends to be high, there tends to be a greater tendency for people to belong to and shop at a natural food co-op than to shop at a conventional food store. The reverse is also true. About 10 percentage of people with only a high school education, the 
much lower than the percentage of those people who tend to shop at a natural food co-op. Similar correlation exists when it comes to white collar employment. And you would expect this because white collar employment tends to go hand in hand with levels of college education. We also find that there is a significant bent toward high levels of sales penetration where the level of household with income levels of between 50 and $150,000 a year is greater. The higher the percentage of these income groupings that exist in a trade area, the higher the levels of sales penetration tend to be. And the reverse is also true. Lower incomes, people generally will shop at uh, less expensive stores. The other end of the income spectrum is an interesting uh, observation, and that is that once people get to income levels significantly above $150,000 a year, doesn't mean they're not going to eat as healthy, but generally speaking, most people eat out a lot more often, and so their food at home expenditures tend to be less. Another location characteristic has to do with access. Access. And this is defined as the ease or difficulty with which people in various parts of the trade area can get to and from the store. And we typically think of uh, access in terms of being local or regional or both. For example, to the extent that, that your store is situated uh, at the intersection of two major service arteries, this would probably give you very good local access, may also give you very good regional access. But it's important to recognize that a difference between local access and regional access in the subject of the trade area and also in the level of sales penetration you're likely to get. If you have a store that has very strong local access but does not have very much in the way of regional access, then in this particular store you are going to find high levels of sales penetration close to the store, but you're going to find a relatively small trade area. Many neighborhood locations would suggest that this is the type of access. It's more restrictive. It's much less widespread. On the other hand, suppose you are located on a major highway, uh, for example, right here in interstate uh, on all three. This would constitute regional access. This means that it is much easier for people from a distance to get to and from the store because major highways and major expressways exist to facilitate that kind of access. So it's important to understand whether the access that is provided to a, a site is local or regional because it impacts the size and the shape of the trade area. It affects the size of the shopping basket. It affects the frequency of shopping trips. One additional aspect of access that we want to uh, look at for a uh, brief minute, and that is how does the access vary by time of day? Shopping center developers are great at coming to a proposed tenant and saying, wow, we've got 45,000 cars a day passed by your site. My answer to that is always, what time of day does that happen? Because if you are located on a major commuter route, then in all respects, you are probably going to do very little business between 7 or 9 in the morning and between 4 and 6 at night because the congestion is going to serve as a hindrance to access. On the other hand, if the traffic is fairly spread out throughout the day and it, it, it or consists rather of not only commuters going to and from work, but also people going shopping and traveling for any number of reasons, then you have the opportunity to capture uh, a greater percentage of this traffic that's going by because it tends to be spread out throughout the day. As a result, um, I always ask that question whenever a developer comes to me and tries to convince me how many cars a day pass by the site. 
I'm concerned not just with the quantity of traffic that goes by, but also the quality of traffic. In other words, is it shopping oriented or is it strictly commuter traffic? If it's commuter traffic, then on the way home at night, you may find that you have a bump in business. But here again, it depends on whether congestion stands in the way of uh, good uh, entrance into and exit from your store. Another element of location characteristics has to do with retail synergy. Retail synergy is the absence or absence of other retailers in the vicinity of your site. And uh, when I look at retail synergy, I look at it as either beneficial or detrimental. Beneficial synergy would exist when you have a number of retailers close to you that appeal to the same type of target customer. Generally, this would include, for a retail food co-op, this would generally include bookstores, office supply stores, coffee shops, bakeries, any kind of specialty store that has its primary appeal to middle income and upper middle income, better educated, more oriented toward white collar shoppers, as these constitute your shoppers. There are some other retailers, on the other hand, that may work actually against you because they tend to frame an area as more lower income oriented. For example, and, and, uh, and there's also another category of them that is uh, we find if they're located too close to the food store, they can actually impact the parking in a negative way. Um, if you have, for example, right next door to your food store, if you have a bowling alley or if you have a health club, if you have a movie theater, if you have two or three fine dining restaurants, et cetera, et cetera, all of these things tend to bring people to them who park for a considerable length of time whenever they come. When you go bowling, you don't go bowling for 15 minutes. You typically go bowling for an hour or more. When you go to a health club, you're typically there for a fairly significant amount of time. When you go to a movie, you're usually there for at least two hours. When you're going to a fine dining restaurant, it's usually an event that lasts you know, two or three hours rather than a quick in and out. To the extent that these kinds of retailers are located too close to you, you're going to look out your store and you're going to find your parking lot filled with cars and no shoppers in your store. These people are all involved in these other activities. So it depends on where the additional retailers are located, kinds of retailers they are, and so on and so forth, as to whether or not they are, in fact, beneficial. The last consideration when we come to looking at location characteristics is the location of the store within the trade area. Is the store relatively central to or at least readily available or accessible to the bulk of the trade area population base? A phrase that I often use, and those of you who know me have probably heard me use this, if the, if the location is at the intersection of Maine and Maine, that pretty much says it all. The location is right in the middle of its trade area. It's uh, readily accessible from all directions um, and is a fairly good location. Is it located in a desirable area where potential shoppers travel on a regular uh, basis? And on the other side, are there any major barriers that exist? Barriers being anything that might stand in the way of shoppers or potential shoppers getting to your store. For example, expressways, cemeteries, rivers, lakes, industrial belts, railroads, etc., can very well be barriers to trade. You don't want to be located where any one of those major barriers stands between you and a major part of your trade area population because what that basically does is it cuts off that area of your trade area. And when you look at the sales penetration rates throughout your trade area, you are going to find that they are going to fall off significantly because of that barrier. So those are the primary things that we look at when we're looking at location characteristics. Um, Stuart, are there any questions there yet? Well, we've been catching up on the list now. 
I've got several for you. <clears throat> the uh, one question is, is just on basic uh, demographics. Are you using 2000 census data? We are using current census data as updated by Claritas. Claritas is the leading demographic research firm in the country. They have developed a number of models that uh, take historical trend data in demographics and they extrapolate to current years. So we're using something more recent than 2000. Having said that, it is data that is based on models and not on exact census. And so as a result of that, uh, it, it, it's not going to be exactly accurate, but it's going to be uh, closer than if we were relying on data that's eight years old. Well, that follow up to that then, how, how does that relate then when, if you have a location that is experiencing major change over the last years, how do you do the demographics? Uh, that poses a particular challenge to the location research person, and that is to look at, you know, uh, an area, and, and there are many uh, natural food co-ops that are going into gentrified areas where traditionally the area has been kind of down and out, but is undergoing somewhat of a rebirth today. One of the things that we do as part of our field work, we spend time with the city planners at, at the, the city uh, uh, municipal offices, county planning offices, et cetera, et cetera, and get their input on what is, is, under, is going on in the way of change uh, that may result in some uh, changing demographics over time. We will also, uh, if it's in an area where there's a lot of development activity going on, we will get in touch with developers and find out, for example, what kind of houses they're putting in. Uh, as a result of that, we may find that the demographics will, in fact, be changing, if only because the developers are going to cause that change to occur by virtue of what they're building. So we don't deal just with the, the Claritas estimates. We will also get local estimates from municipal governments, county governments, uh, community planning agencies, whatever sources we have. Okay. When you're talking about the uh, ideal demographic makeup of a community, when a store is, is planning, should they be looking at specific percentage of each demographic or, or you know, targeting 50% Caucasian in their market, or for example? Um, the, 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 the racial ethnicity is one that I, that I typically deal with differently than I deal with the others. The reason that the white ethnicity shows up so strongly is because, for the most part, food co-ops are in areas that are, are predominantly white. As a result, we don't really have a handle on what will happen if a co-op is in a predominantly uh, non-white area? We are experimenting with that right now. There's, uh, I've done a study for a new co-op, and Susan Triggs, I know that you're in the audience. Um, we uh, just recently did a, a, a co-op study for a co-op in a very ethnically uh, non-white area in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, we're going to be looking at another one over the next few weeks in uh, – in Huntsville, Alabama, another uh, predominantly non-white area. <clears throat> My sense is that uh, the white ethnicity is not a causal, but rather a, a resulting uh, factor uh, as a result of where co-ops have been located up to this point in time. And I think that, that in time, we're going to see a significant change in that uh, demographic. When it comes to the other demographics, uh, we're doing co-op studies. Uh, we've got one going on right now in Colorado. Uh, we've recently done one in Oregon, where the percent college is under 20%, uh, which is fairly low on the demographic uh, the profile list, especially when you compare it with, for example, a co-op in Hanover, New Hampshire, or a co-op in Ann Arbor, Michigan, or a co-op in Madison, Wisconsin, where percent college is 50, 60, 70%. What we're finding is that as time goes along, these limits that I showed on a few slides ago, these limits are gradually softening and they're broadening. What this means is that uh, the, the, the percentage of people beyond those original demographics that are becoming interested in food issues and food cleanliness and healthy food and natural food and organics and so on and so forth 
that is beginning to expand beyond the traditional uh, demographics, uh, and it's becoming a little bit more widespread. This is happening because of two major things, in my opinion. First of all, Whole Foods is, is uh, uh, bringing about a tremendous amount of uh, publicity to natural and organic every time they open a new store. Uh, and secondly, uh, just the whole issue of organics, the whole issue of natural food is much more in the limelight today than it was 10 or 15 years ago. As a result, I'm finding that these traditional limits to the demographics are beginning to soften and they're beginning to be a little bit more, uh, you know, say instead of the ages of 35 to 54, uh, we're seeing younger and older limits and so on. Do you want a couple more, Pete, or um, can you hold on to those? I'd like to get going with the site characteristics now. All right. And, uh, my, my guess is the way it's going, Stuart, that we'll have some time at the end. All right. Very good. Hold on. Boom. Okay. Yep. And let's move ahead now to the next uh, category uh, under what makes for the right site. And those of you who know me know that I'm a bugaboo when it comes to site characteristics. And the reason that I'm a bugaboo is because I have seen many, many stores in my career that have failed. And the reason that they have failed has been due to site characteristics. So I want to spend some time on this because um, all of you new co-ops that are getting formed, getting started these days, uh, looking at things like these various site characteristics can help you in the outset understand what makes for a good site, but it also will help the market analyst when you get to that point in terms of kind of pre-screening some of the sites accordingly. I look at three major site characteristics. First one of these I look at is visibility. And um, it's, um, it, it, I mean, it, it seems as, as plain as the nose on the end of your face, and yet I've seen a lot of stores where visibility does not exist. Uh, basically, when I talk about visibility, you want to be able to see the store from as many directions as possible and from as far away as possible. Hence, when you start talking about the directions, you're thinking about a good location, good site being at a corner. If you're on a corner, then you can be seen from four directions. If you're in line in the middle of a block, then that probably means you can only be seen primarily from two directions. So uh, corner locations are better. Talk to any retailer and they will confirm that. You also want the visibility to be from as far away as possible. And whether this be visibility of the store itself or signage that may exist in front of the store, whether it be a monument sign or a pylon sign, uh, to the extent that it can be seen from as far away as possible, it enhances a person's opportunity to stop there. It doesn't do any good at all if you're on a 40-mile-an-hour street and you can't see the store until you're in front of it. By then, it's too late. So you want to be able to see the store from some distance uh, and hopefully from all four directions. A couple of things that, that I always like to point out. Number one, 16% or one in six Americans moves every year. This doesn't mean the same person moves every year. What this means is that one-sixth of all Americans move every year. As a result of that, um, they're looking for new stores. A study was done a few years ago that showed that the average food shopper selects their regular store within three to four weeks after moving into a new area. So put those two statistics together with the need for visibility, and it becomes pretty apparent that if you are not seen within that first few weeks of when a person moves into town, you're probably not in the running in terms of their immediate shift to you as their primary food store. It may happen down the road somewhere when they, you know, people become more in tune with the market and they begin to establish friendships and somebody mentions, oh, have you shopped at the co-op? And the typical response is, oh, is there a co-op here? I didn't see it. So you can facilitate that by having a store that has a high degree of visibility in all directions and from as far away as possible uh, and adding signage to the extent that it is available, adding signage that will work to your benefit. 
The next side characteristic I like to talk about is ingress egress, or how easy is it to enter and or exit the store's parking lot. It's the ease or the difficulty associated with entering or exiting a food store parking lot. This presumes, of course, the existence of an off-street parking lot. Now, there are a few co-ops out there that do not have off-street parking lots. Generally speaking, a co-op that does not have an off-street parking lot is has several characteristics. Number one, it has customers who have a very small basket size because a lot of them are walking some distance in order to get to the store. And when they walk out of the store, they're not going to carry very much. Number two, these people typically are going to shop your store quite frequently, several times a week, in kind of the European urban model. Um, and, 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 and thirdly, you're not going to have a very large trade area because if you don't have an off-street parking lot, people aren't going to be driving to you from any great distance knowing that there's not, not going to be any place for them to park when they get there. So I'm presuming that the existence of an off-street parking lot uh, in, in, in talking about the ingress egress. When you consider what makes for good ingress egress, you talk about things like deceleration lanes in the frontage street, left-hand turn lanes, medians, traffic signals, frontage street speed limits, things of this nature. And just use your head when you're looking at a site. If it's a 55 mile an hour speed limit in front of your store, people aren't going to stop. Because once they get off that speed limit, once they get into your parking lot, how easy is it for them to be able to get back out? So these are things that enter into what makes for good ingress egress. There are certain traffic controls that can facilitate ingress egress, while there are others that can serve as hindrances. Medians, for example, uh, greatly um, will uh, hinder entrance to your store from the direction that people need to make a left-hand turn. I was a witness to a major supermarket chain in, in uh, suburban Boston who opened a store uh, at a, a, a location one time where in order to get into the store, you had to co be coming from one direction because of a median. And when you left the store, you had to leave going in that same direction and you had to go three quarters of a mile before you could pull a U-turn. That store failed in less than a year. And this was a major supermarket. So make sure when you are looking at sites and you are looking at ingress, egress characteristics that you look at those th kinds of things, medians, speed limits, deceleration lanes, left turn lanes, traffic signals, traffic arrows, and so on and so forth. And then finally, the third characteristic is parking. When I talk about parking, I talk about two aspects of parking. The configuration of the parking lot and the capacity of the parking lot. When I talk about configuration of the lot, I look at things like the direction of the drive lanes. The drive lanes should be perpendicular to the front of the store rather than parallel. The most advantageous parking, and this is based on a number of studies, exists within 300 to perhaps 350 feet from the store entrance. And the parking that is prime should be within sight of the entrance exit, not to one side or the other. These are important aspects of the configuration of a parking lot. And, and in order to uh, carry that one step further, there's an increasing uh, move today in urban areas towards parking garages, underground parking, rooftop parking, et cetera, et cetera. There are certain markets in the United States where this type of configuration has become acceptable. It has become acceptable not because people like it, but because they have no choice. If you are in urban San Francisco, urban Los Angeles, urban Seattle, uh, Portland, Chicago, New York, a few major markets with high density of population, you are going to find parking garages, you are going to find parking that is on the roof, parking that is underground. In these particular instances, customers are becoming accepting of it, not because they like it, but because they have no choice. But in most other markets in the United States, garage parking, parking garages, rooftop parking, et cetera, et cetera, 
has not yet become accepted and is to be looked at with a degree of skepticism. Um, I think that in time, uh, we're probably going to see an evolution in the United States to where we're going to find more and more uh, parking garages and, and uh, types of parking situations that, uh, uh, you know, currently are not that acceptable. I think in time, those things are going to come. But I think it's going to take time. I think it's going to be an evolution. I don't think it's going to be a revolution in, the, in terms of getting there. And finally, the capacity of the parking lot. Generally speaking, even in the most urban of locations, you want to have a parking lot that has about four parking spaces as a minimum per 1,000 square feet of store. At the other extreme, in a totally suburban site where virtually everybody drives to the store, you want to have upwards of eight cars per 1,000 square feet. Now, this has been based on a number of studies, uh, many of which I've actually conducted myself over the years. Um, but it points up the fact that when most people go to a food store, when they walk out of that food store, they're carrying in a basket, in a shopping cart, you know, $100 to $200 worth of food. And as a result of that, they're going to be driving to the store. They're not going to be walking. They're not going to be riding the bus. They're not going to be riding a bicycle. They're going to be driving to the store. And as a result, they need a place to park. And they need that place to park to be fairly close to the store. The number of shoppers that, when they go to the store, may have young children with them means that when they walk out the front door, pushing a basket with $100 worth of groceries, they probably have one or two kids in tow and are not about to walk across the street or down the block, or into the third floor of a parking garage in order to find their car. So you want to provide parking that is accessible to the shopper, in front of the store, within sight of the front door, and that there are enough spaces to accommodate the business. And what we have come up with is basically that that range of cars needs to be somewhere between four and eight cars per thousand square feet, depending upon how urban versus suburban the site may be. Very rarely will you find eight cars per thousand square feet. It just isn't found. That's the ideal. To the extent that you can get close to that, more power to you, I certainly urge it. But if you can only get seven cars per thousand square feet, it doesn't mean that you turn down the site. It just means that you're not going to have quite the ideal situation, but you're certainly going to have better than most. Okay, uh, that pretty much finishes um, my discussion of finding the right site in terms of the uh, facility, site, and location characteristics. Uh, Stuart, um, how are we doing for questions? All right, well, they're backing up for us. Um, okay. Level one parking. Um, one is if you have a really good location otherwise, how important is that parking remain? Well, um, it's, it's important that you have the parking. Obviously, if it's a very good location and you have something less than ideal parking, you make do with what you have. But when you, when you are talking about limitations in parking, where you do not have enough parking, you have to operate your store accordingly. And you have to remember that there are certain things you want to do to maximize the parking that you do have. For example, uh, no employees are allowed to park on site, period. No discussion, no, uh, no exceptions. Uh, you want every parking space to count for customers. Uh, that's one thing you can do. A second thing you can do is urge some of your customers to perhaps shop at a little bit different times uh, when the store perhaps is not as busy, to try to even out your business during the day so that you don't end up with periods of time during the, the shopping day or the week when you have a number of unused spaces, and yet other times you have people circling around trying to, to wait for parking spaces. So there are things you can do, but, the, but the, 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 the practical thing is to understand that if, in fact, you do have something less than ideal parking, that you want to acknowledge that and do everything you can 
to work with your customers, work with your employees to make sure that every parking space gets maximum utilization. That's about the best I can offer. Uh, you know, it, it, it's a good site, good location, but um, only mediocre parking, then you do what you can. And, and uh, if it means uh, leasing a lot a block away for your employees to park on, then that's what you do. How much credit do you give for street parking? Well, I, I mean, I, obviously I acknowledge that it's there. The, the, the concern I have with street parking is it's not within your control. I worked in a study, for example, one time where there was a parking lot right next to the site. It was a municipal parking lot. And uh, the, the, uh, the co-op came to me and said, well, you know, Jason, we have this big municipal lot right next to us. I said, yes, I understand that, but if I'm a bank, I'm not going to lend you money to do a store if that's your parking because you have no control over that thing. If the city tomorrow decides to do something to create a no parking zone along the street or to take that parking lot away and put a building on it, there's nothing you can do. So my concern is that the parking that you have is parking that you can control. If it's street parking, you can't control it. Uh, if you can, if you have the opportunity to work with the city in terms of getting some controls over it, great. And I would certainly urge that. But the problem with street parking is you can't control it. If I want to shop next door to you and I want to leave my car there all day long, there's nothing you can do about that as the store owner uh, of the food store. Would you say there is a minimum, absolute minimum of parking? Uh, well, the absolute minimum, I would think, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I've suggested, you know, four cars per thousand square feet in an urban site. And an urban site is defined as that site where you have public transportation available. You have people who walk, ride bikes, uh, people who uh, ride public transportation, and so on and so forth. Even there, you want to have at least four cars per thousand. So I guess my minimum by default would be four cars per thousand square feet. But in a suburban shopping center, uh, in a suburban uh, area, four cars per thousand is a long way from having adequate parking. If, just so you know, you're you're tending to break up a little bit on us uh, from time to time, Pete. Um, I'm not sure if there's anything you can do about it. But um, one more question. Sure, go ahead. All right. If you had a choice of a corner entrance that could face a main thoroughfare with parking on the side or an entrance facing the parking but not facing the main street, which is better? Uh, in that instance, I would probably go for the corner entrance. Uh, and the reason that I say that uh, is uh, I'm assuming that this is in an urban situation where you're going to have some walk-in trade. If it's walk-in trade and, you're, and your uh, entrance is on the side facing the parking lot, you're going to miss out on walk-in. So I think my preference would probably be for a corner entrance. Okay. Um, have you seen a change in trade in area demographics based on the movements to buy local food and, and organic local food? Um, I, have, I have seen that that's one of the things that is leading towards the broadening of the demographics to which I referred earlier. Uh, there's quite a movement out there today towards buying local, uh, local sustainability, et cetera. And this is something that seems to cross demographic lines. Um, it is not something that is in the purview of just college educated or white collar people. It tends to cross uh, demographic lines uh, quite broadly. So the answer, the, the short answer to the question is yes, I'm seeing a broadening of the demographics because of the increasing emphasis on uh, buying local, the increasing uh, emphasis, the increasing interest on local sustainability and agriculture. And finally, there have been several comments and questions that are similar in, in discussing the idea of co-ops seem to attract a lot more foot traffic, a lot more people that are willing to use alternative transportation. At the same time, the people that do use cars tend to buy more. Um, I, I think that different people are responding differently to that concept here, but there is definitely a lot of interest in that. Well, one, one, of, the, one of the things, uh, I mean, I, I, I agree wholeheartedly with the alternative transportation. Um, 
having said that, what, the, one, the one thing that, that I've noticed, and I think if you talk to a lot of existing co-ops, you'll find this, and that is that the typical co-op food store today appeals to uh, memberships and non-members alike. The typical co-op today will get anywhere from 40 to 60% of its business from members, but the reverse of that means it's getting from 60 to 40% of its business from non-members. Non-members typically arrive more uh, by, um, uh, you know, may, may, may not have the, quite the same values, the like same concerns. There are a lot of non-members who shop co-ops simply because of the quality of food where nothing else is an issue. They're interested mostly in just getting good food, uh, which they have down may have a name organic, it may have a name natural, or what have you. But the fact of the matter is, what they're interested in is good food. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, you're finding that um, uh, a, a co-op today, while it is uh, endowed with the uh, necessity of, of you know, responding to the needs of its members, a co-op food store today is, in fact, a uh, place of public accommodation, and it does, in fact, get a significant portion of its business from non-members. And it has an obligation to be able to be competitive with respect to those people as well. All right. I think we are caught up. Okay. And let's move on to the second part of the uh, presentation, which is determining store sales potential. And I'm going to move through this um, a little bit more quickly um, because a lot of this, frankly, is just numbers crunching uh, once we get into it. Um, the important thing, as far as I'm concerned, uh, is, uh, you know, we need to center our discussion on the concept of a trade area. Trade area is defined as that area within which a store will obtain anywhere from 65 to 85% of its business. It's a, it's a piece of geography, and it's defined on the basis of fieldwork observations, uh, the existence uh, or absence of barriers, uh, distance to adjacent markets, uh, locations of competition, uh, analogous store information, and it's also based on something we call Riley's Law of Retail Gravitation, which I won't get into, but it basically has to do with what helps define a trade area. Once we have defined the trade area, we need to determine what the current household population base is for that particular trade area. And here again, uh, we go back to one of those things that I mentioned earlier, and that is the opportunity to take away the group quarters population from the total population in terms of identifying the household population base from which prospective shoppers will be derived. We then will also look at the trade area demographics, and these are the same things that we talked about a little bit ago. The percentage that is ethnically white between the ages of 35 and 54, uh, the percentage that is college educated, white collar employed, percentage with household incomes of between 50 and 150,000 people. We look at those not because those will necessarily determine whether or not this will be uh, substantial. Uh, potential for a food store, that just enables us to determine what are the appropriate analogous store information that we're going to be used in determining the skills forecast, and I'll get into that a little bit later. We want to determine then the level of trade area market potential. Trade area market potential basically means the number of dollars on a per capita basis or on a total market area basis that are spent or have the propensity to be spent for natural food. It's based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Diary Studies, and it results in an estimate of per capita food store expenditure potential. The per capita food store expenditure potential is an estimate, on average, of what every man, woman, and child in a household in a trade area is expected to spend on the kind of merchandise that you would carry in your store which for purposes of this demonstration, this uh, pr uh, presentation, uh, is natural food. In terms of determining the trade area market potential, we develop what is the per capita expenditure potential, which is per person, 
and we then multiply that by the population. Another thing we need to do in terms of determining the sales potential, we need to look at the competitive environment. We need to evaluate it. Is it a highly competitive environment? Is it one where competition is not very uh, present? In doing a market study, we are looking at the trade area competition in which we categorize every competitor as either direct or indirect. We categorize each competitor as strong or weak. We categorize each competitor as intercepting, impacting, or adjacent. Now let me explain those real quickly. A direct competitor is a competitor that is basically carrying the same kind of merchandise as your store will carry. Uh, and therefore will be competing directly against you for your customer. A typical direct competitor for a natural food co-op might be another co-op, might be a natural food store such as Wild Oats or Whole Foods or an independent, uh, some type of a specialty store uh, that has its primary appeal to um, the, uh, the type of merchandise that you're carrying. An indirect competitor, on the other hand, might be a conventional supermarket that has some level of presentation, of natural food within its merchandise mix. We categorize every competitor as strong or weak. Here we are looking at uh, how strong they compete against you or how weakly they compete against you. Obviously that makes sense. But what makes a strong competitor? A strong competitor in an indirect sense might be uh, somebody who has a conventional food store that might have a what I would call a store within a store a 1,500 to 2,000 square foot natural food department within the store, uh, including a strong bulk section, including uh, eight or 10 doors of, of natural frozen food, uh, might have six or eight doors of natural dairy products, might have uh, hormone free uh, beef and pork products, uh, free range chickens, et cetera, et cetera. That might be a conventional store, but it still might represent a strong indirect competitor as far as your store is concerned. A weak store might be one that has very little in the way of natural food uh, competition against you. An intercepting competitor is a competitor that exists between your store and a particular part of your trade area. That competitor will be located in such a fashion as to intercept people on their way to your store, and by intercepting them means that they no longer get to your store, they get cut off at the pass, if you will. An impacting competitor is a competitor that basically impacts your ability to achieve sales penetration levels in a particular part of the trade area. And finally, an adjacent competitor is a competitor that is located very close to you, and just as you have an effect and an impact throughout the trade area, that competitor might have a similar impact throughout your trade area. We would also then want to evaluate uh, as part of the sales potential the food source sites. And here we're going to evaluate the sites on the basis of the three primary characteristics that we just discussed, facility, location, and site. Oftentimes in doing a market study for a new co-op, we are asked to look at a number of different sites and determine which ones perhaps might be more appropriate than others in uh, terms of, of securing the site for the store. Uh, we just recently finished a, a study uh, in Pendleton, Oregon, um, in which we looked at four or five different sites. Uh, one or two of those sites are obviously far superior to some of the other sites that we looked at, and we saw those out in our report. Um, we're looking at uh, a number of different sites, uh, and, and based on our evaluation and these particular characteristics, we will then typically do a forecast for the, the best of the sites, and then rate each of the other sites as a percentage of that forecast against it. In determining food store potential, we typically use what we refer to as a proprietary database of analogs. An analog is store performance data that comes from an analog store, and the word analog basically comes from analogous. In our database, we have close to 100 natural food co-ops, and we have sales performance data for these co-ops. 
um, and uh, trade area data for these co-ops. And what we're typically going to do when we're doing a study for a new site, for a new co-op, we will look for analogous food co-ops in terms of their trade area size, location type, competitive environment, store size, demographic characteristics, any other characteristics that may be important. This is necessary in order for us to produce what we call a reality-based forecast. And a, a simple but very ludicrous example, it doesn't do us any good at all to use a future consumer co-op analog in the heart of the University District of Seattle as an analog for producing a store sales projection for a new food co-op in rural Iowa. Downtown University District of Seattle is not at all similar to and analogous to rural Iowa. That's a very ludicrous example, but the point I'm trying to make is that we will search through our database and we will look for stores and market areas and sales penetration levels where we can find degrees of analogous situation so that when we develop our forecast on the basis of current performance of existing stores, we're using the existing stores that are, in fact, comparable and similar and analogous. We do need for that. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry. There's a cluster of questions here related to this particular topic, and I wondered if we could take a quick look at those or if you'd prefer to wait. No, go right ahead. Okay, and I, and I want to, I'm going to give you all three at once and then the follow-up. Um, one of our, our attendees says that he has searched the Bureau of Labor Statistics website and could find nothing specific about uh, that would be required for trade area and natural foods, and where could you find that? Another person is asking whether SPINS data is, is part of your analog assessment. And a third, where can you purchase analog data? And the, the, the overall question, I think, is that this complex, this process is very complex. Are, are individuals expected to be able to figure this out, or should they be relying on professionals? That was a very leading question, wasn't it, Stuart? Uh, I hope so. Um, <laughs> um, a lot of the data that I'm talking about here uh, comes from uh, a lot of proprietary work that myself and others have done. Um, you will not find the Bureau of Labor Statistics stuff the way I described it in the BLS website because they don't have it. We have taken their base data and have done regression analysis on our own in terms of determining what are the demographics that are most appropriate. So you will not find that on a website. Uh, that is proprietary information that myself and others have done. Uh, we've developed it at our own cost. Uh, and frankly, it is our data that we use on the behalf of studies that we're contracted to conduct. Um, the, the same is true with, the, with the, uh, you know, the, the analog database. This is data that we have developed over the years for existing uh, natural food stores and co-ops across the country. Um, uh, that data resides in a database that, that we have paid for, that we have developed on our own um, and for use in, in doing this kind of work. This is, uh, while I keep saying this is not rocket science, and it, it's not, uh, but on the other hand, it does utilize certain things that we have done with existing data uh, that makes the data more usable for what we do with it. Um, this data is not readily available. Uh, and this sounds like a very self-serving statement on my part, and I guess maybe it is, but uh, that's part of what you get when you hire a professional to do a market study uh, is access to these kinds of models, these kinds of things uh, that are not generally available because there are a number of consulting firms nationally that have taken this data uh, that is published and have done things with this data uh, in terms of making it more useful. We can look at uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics raw data. Anybody can look at the raw data. What we have done is we have made that raw data much more usable in terms of the kind of work that we do. And as a result of that, 
uh, you know, that's part of what you get when you hire a professional to do uh, market studies uh, relative to determining, uh, you know, the, the, the sales potential that you are likely to achieve in, in a new uh, in a new food store. Is, is that a, a sufficient answer, uh, Stuart? I think it covers it. All right. Well, unless you want to take more questions now, I, I, I just thought that that one was topical. Well, I, I mean, are, are there other questions that have to do with the with the, uh, the uh, sales potential up to this point? Well, let's see. Um, yeah, I think there might be a couple. Uh, okay. Are there studies that show how far a majority of people, well, closely related, would travel in urban versus rural rural areas to get to groceries, and how would that relate to competitive factors? The, the, the biggest determining factor in terms of how far a person will shop, or will, excuse me, will travel to shop, the biggest uh, factors are competition. Um, if I have to drive 17 miles in order to find a food store, I don't have a choice. I either grow it myself or I travel 17 miles, or I have somebody else travel the 17 miles on my behalf. Um, so competition is obviously one of the largest factors in determining the distance. When you look at an urban area, you typically find a lot of food stores, uh, which means you do not have to travel 17 miles to find a food store. You may have to travel two blocks uh, or two miles or something of that nature, um, but you don't have to travel as far in an urban environment. Generally speaking, when it comes to conventional food stores, Generally speaking, a supermarket needs about 8,000 people to support it. Now, that means that 8,000 people does not constitute a trade area. What it means is that if you take the population of a metropolitan area and divide it by 8,000, that's going to give you roughly the number of full-line supermarkets that exist in that particular market area, about 8,000 people per store. But now you're talking about a natural food store, which is something more specialized and more destination-oriented than the typical conventional Kroger or Safeway or uh, Albertsons. Uh, and as a result of that, uh, people typically will drive further distances to get to a destination-oriented store. Natural food stores typically are motivated more on the basis of shopper demographics primarily education and white-collar employment, than they are by convenience of location. Most people, when they shop at a natural food store, drive past one or more conventional stores in order to get to the natural food store because it is a specific destination for them. So uh, it's very difficult to generalize on the, the subject of distance, how far people typically will travel. But what it means is that people typically will travel further for a natural food store than they will for a conventional food store. The other side of that same point is part of the reason people will travel further to get to a natural food store is because they have to travel further to get to a natural food store. There just aren't as many natural food stores and co-ops across the landscape as there are conventional stores. It takes far more than 8,000 people to support a natural food store. And as a result of that, uh, you will not have anywhere near as many food stores, uh, natural food stores, excuse me, in a market area as you would conventional food stores. Whole Foods, for example, considers that it has, uh, you know, maximized uh, a particular market uh, when it has, you know, maybe four or five or six stores in that major metropolitan market, that may be the same market where Safeway has 30 stores. So um, typically natural food store trade areas are larger geographically. They're larger in terms of people because not everybody in those trade areas will be a potential shopper because of their demographics. So that's a long way around getting to that answer, but I hope that, that uh, answers the question. Okay. Um, one more? Sure, go ahead. All right. 
since your analog database comes mostly from stores that have the kind of demographics you talked about, a high percentage of whites, educated people, 35 to 54, et cetera, how can you use those analog projections for startups that have trade populations that don't match that? We, we, in our analog database, we have stores that, that, that run the gamut for, uh, and, and let's take college education. Um, we have one analog store that in its trade area has 9% of the population has a college degree. At the other extreme, we have an analog store that has over 70% of its trade area population has a college degree. And, and it runs the gamut all the way through that. So, um, we, we do have representation of, uh, you know, of, of a wide spectrum of uh, the demographics. But the other important thing to recognize is that there is no such thing as a perfect analog. There is no such thing as an analog store that is an exact uh, replica, exact duplication of the demographics uh, that we are looking for in a particular trade area. And so what we have learned to do is we have learned to make adjustments to sales penetration data on the basis of demographics. And we will therefore be able to infer um, sales penetration rates uh, that may be not exactly in the, in the database per se, but we can infer what would happen if they were there. Because we have studied the database enough to be able to relate what happens when college education goes up? What happens when income levels go down? What happens when uh, age groups go up or go down and so on and so forth? We know what happens uh, from the basis of having studied this database and used it for years and years and years. So there is no perfect analog, but we, but we have learned how to adjust analog data accordingly. All right, thanks. Okay. All right, uh, the slide we're on has to do with the individual census tracts uh, because when we do a sales forecast, we don't forecast the sales for the total store. We forecast, uh, after we define the trade area, we are looking at each individual census tract within that trade area. And there may be five census tracts, there may be 25 census tracts. But we're looking at the individual census tract demographics, and we will develop a sales forecast for each and every census tract in a proposed store's trade area. By doing so, we then say, okay, we now have a sales forecast for every part of the trade area, and we then add all of those individual census tract forecasts together, and that gives us a total trade area forecast. We then are able to look at the total trade area forecast, and we're going to say, okay, and generally speaking, for those analogs that we have used, what proportion of their business comes from beyond the trade area, uh, which is the, the uh, basically the, the fill in the blank, if you will, after we determine what percent comes from within the trade area. So when we've added up all of the trade area volume, we then go back to the analog database and we say, okay, what proportion are we going to expect that's going to come from beyond the trade area? And that is the way we arrive at, arrive at the total trade area. Um, it's basically adding up the performance of within each individual trade area sector or census tract and then plussing on whatever portion of business we expect to get from beyond the trade area. Generally speaking, once we have done this, we will then go back to the analog database and we will forecast it again. But we will forecast the store this time on a total store basis as kind of a reflection back on, hey, are we being realistic? In other words, we look at each and every individual part of the trade area for a forecast, but then we look at the total store performance and forecast it again and see how close we are. Generally speaking, the macro level forecast and the micro-level forecast usually are fairly close. If they're not, it's back to the drawing board we go. But if they are, in fact, fairly close, then we're reasonably comfortable with our forecast, and generally that's what you will see in our final report.
So you'll see here, we again do the um, review uh, and, and look at capture rates, we look at forecast, and we look at the total sales of the store relative to uh, how exactly the two forecast methodologies compare. Once we have done the whole forecast, we then go back and look at population growth rates. We look at um, market share. We look at market at large growth rates. We look at market share maturity rates. All of these things because one of the things that we try to do is we try to put together for a proposed co-op, we try to put together a sales forecast for the first few years of that store's life. We want to be able to identify when will the store likely open so that we can be realistic in terms of what we put forth as an opening date and what we put forth as year one, year two, et cetera, sales. And when we put those years together, we're looking at the maturity rate of the store, we're looking at the population growth that we're expecting within the trade area, we're looking at growth in the natural food market at large, and so on. This way, when you get a market study from us, you are getting basically the first few years of what the store is likely to achieve in sales, uh, which means that you can then put together a performance statement to show the expected levels of profitability for those same years. Once the sales forecast has been produced, recommendations are then made relative to store size, the store format, and specialty departments to be incorporated. One of the things that I am very um, strong on is I believe, and, and this is based on many, many years of doing this, but I believe that a potential signature department of a natural food co-op is the deli. And so I will almost always make a recommendation that to whatever extent possible, a natural food co-op should have a deli, whether it's a self-service or a service deli, and as much as possible that it have some type of a deli cafe seating area. Many people's first venture into a natural food store, a natural food co-op, is to buy a sandwich or a salad or a bowl of soup or something from the deli. This gives the the, uh, the opportunity to become, if you will, the signature department of the, uh, the natural food store. And as a result of that, uh, to the extent that you do a good job in doing a deli, that can translate then into future regular shoppers at that store. The first foray into the store may be in the deli, but from then on, they may be coming back for their regular uh, shopping. So we'll make recommendations in terms of the departments, but almost always there will be some recommendation relative to some type of a deli uh, in there. Finally, any sales forecast, and this is a very important part and all too often it gets lost, any sales forecast must be interpreted in light of a number of assumptions. Assumptions as to store size and format. Assumptions as to the major specialty departments, facility site and location characteristics, population growth, growth in the natural food market at large, competitive environment, marketing, advertising, and outreach activities. The reason that I emphasize these, um, there have been several instances where we have done studies for a food store, a new co-op, and by the time the store opens, they end up opening at a site different from what was originally done in the market study. Which basically means one of the primary assumptions of the study has now changed. Or, uh, for example, a, a store might open and it will open and it is underperforming and I'll ask the question, well, you know, well, now what, what kind of uh, marketing activities are you doing? And, well, we haven't been able to afford to do any marketing activities yet, so, but we're planning on doing some advertising next quarter. Well, if you haven't succeeded in 
Living out that one assumption that's present in the study, that is doing some marketing and advertising, then it's a little bit difficult for you to think about achieving the level of sales that have been forecast if, in fact, you have not built into your process the means for letting people know who you are, what you are, and where you are. Or a store will open, and it may open at a volume differently than we have better forecast for, and as we start checking into it, we find out that a new competitor has opened that was not planned at the time we did our market study. Well, that obviously is a change in assumptions. Or uh, we made the assumption that you were going to have good ingress, egress, and we find out after the store has opened that, in fact, uh, that traffic light that we had told was going to be there is not there. And so, therefore, the ingress, egress is difficult. So the point I'm trying to make is any forecast that we make as part of a market study is done in light of a number of assumptions, and all of these assumptions are spelled out in the market study. And to the extent that any of these assumptions do not come to pass, uh, then there may in fact be a difference in the actual sales versus the level of sales that we had anticipated in our forecast. Uh, There's about three or four minutes left, and yeah. I don't know whether you had more slides to cover, but uh, just, just so you know. Now, I, I finished the main part of the, the presentation. Uh, the other slides I have is just basically the, the, the number crunching, an example of working through the numbers. Uh, basically, uh, we don't have to do that. I, uh, I think answering questions is more important. Uh, well, we have probably more than we have time for, but let's give it a shot. When would you um, recommend getting the professional market analysis during a, an organizational startup? Uh, good question. I, I think the, the, the important time to, to do the market study is when you are getting ready to start getting serious about doing the store. In other words, you're beyond the initial formative stages. You have more than just a, a few interested people that you are convinced that this is going to happen, um, and you're getting ready to start doing the actual planning for doing the store. Um, there's, there's a danger in doing a market study too soon because by the time you get around to actually building the store, uh, the market study may need to be redone because a length of time has passed. Uh, on the other hand, if you wait too long, um, then you may not be able to get the market study done in time for your uh, application to, uh, for financing to a bank or what have you. So uh, I think it basically is when the co-op is far enough along to be a real entity, uh, and then it's pretty sure that it's really going to happen. So if a store has already done a market feasibility study and it's been some t some time passes, how, how long can that study remain valid and uh, would they need to have a review based on a specific site? Uh, generally, generally speaking, a market study in, in most instances is probably good for a year or two. Uh, sometimes it may even be longer than that and sometimes it may be shorter. If you live in Phoenix, Arizona, and you had me do a study three years ago, and now you want to know, is it still valid? I'm going to say no, because that's a market that is radically changing. Uh, the key factor is, has anything changed in the market that might render a difference in the final opinion as to how much business you're going to do? Uh, so there's no rule of thumb other than probably a year or two would be the shelf life of a market study. Uh, but in each individual instance, the primary factors are, has there been a change in population, a change in competition, a change in site, or what have you. Those things would necessitate some type of an update. The, uh, how much do you have to take into effect changes in the political climate, like what we're not calling a recession? <laughs> well, uh, the, way I, the way I typically have looked at this, and I, you know, I've been doing this for over 40 years, so I've been through a few recessions. What I have generally found is that people continue to eat during a recession, but what they do is they will uh, do the old uh, steak to hamburger uh, change. They will buy less expensive calories during a recession, uh, but they will still eat. And the, the basic values in terms of eating will typically uh, be maintained, uh, but instead of buying the more expensive calories, you'll buy the less expensive calories. But generally speaking, uh, food sales continue. All right, we're wrap, running out of time, so I'm going to try to squeeze a 
pair together here, and this is the, the grand finale. Um, how much do professional consultants cost, and how accurate do you find that your studies are over time? Okay. Uh, generally speaking, and and and, I, and 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 I'll just say generally speaking because typically we will give a proposal for doing a market study, but generally speaking. Please note that your conference will expire in 10 minutes. Generally speaking, uh, a, a, a typical uh, market study it runs about $8,000 plus expenses. Uh, and ex the primary expense would be travel expenses for doing the field work. Um, if it is a more um, extravagant study or if it's more of a uh, strategy study, it might be more than that. Um, in terms of accuracy, uh, generally speaking, uh, we tend to be fairly accurate. Uh, having said that, occasionally we miss one. Uh, you know, we're, we're not uh, crystal ball gazers with any degree of, uh, uh, you know, uh, assurance that, uh, you know, that we're going to be absolutely accurate. We're trying to predict human behavior based on the, the maximum amount of information we can gather in part of a study and based on the experiences of existing co-ops. Um, generally speaking, I, uh, typically within plus or minus 10% is a, is a generally acceptable uh, level of accuracy within the location research community. Uh, I think that we're, on, on the whole, we're uh, well within that. Uh, I, I can't remember the numbers offhand, but uh, uh, we did an, an analysis uh, within the past year of all co-ops that had opened uh, based on market research studies, and I think um, I think our, our, our accuracy level was down on 4%, plus or minus 4% uh, on hold. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I can't remember exactly, but it runs in my mind it was something like that. All right, Pete, thanks so much. We have a couple of questions that we didn't get to, and I apologize to the people. Um, I will try to answer a couple myself, um, but uh, we don't want to keep people over time. Pete, thank you very much. We really appreciate your uh, sharing your expertise with us today. Reminders to participants to uh, hold on for a second and uh, fill out that evaluation form. That will be very valuable to us. And there is another webinar next week with.